Today is Friday, June 13th, 2018. My name is Roger Soyset. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. With me is Frank Lutton, also a volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Tom Presley, who served in the U.S. Navy during the Cold War. Mr. Presley's oral history is being recorded for the Atlanta History Center's Vietnam, sorry, Veterans History Project in participation with the Library of Congress. We're honored to have you with us, Mr. Presley, and thank you for participating in the project. Proud to be here. Uh, let's start off with uh, your full name and date of birth and maybe a little bit of your early years. Like childhood years, you mean? Yes. Okay, um, my name is uh, Ephraim Thomas Presley III. I was named after my grandfather. And uh, I grew up in a little town called Roberta, Georgia. If you watch, ever watch Mayberry, <laughs> Andy Griffith show, that's pretty much what it was like. Everybody knew everybody. It was a nice place to grow up, a nice place to retire to, but in, in between years, it ain't too much there. <laughs> Still ain't too much there. It's one of those little country Georgia towns. And I had a great childhood growing up. Uh, and, you know, everybody knew everybody. I played baseball on the high school baseball team. And uh, then when I got time for me to graduate high school, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have money to go to college. And so that's when you have your your heart to heart with your dad. And he was in the Navy from like 46 to 48 after the war. He, he did like two years active, four years reserved. and. And he kind of said, well, son, you know, why don't you just join the Navy, see a little bit of the world, grow up, and then come back and go to school and GI Bill and take off going to college that way. So that sounded like the plan. So that was the plan. So I was, I actually joined the Navy. Uh, I talked to the recruiter guy in Macon, uh, Macon Georgia, because Roberta's like 20 some odd miles from Macon. That's where the nearest recruiting office was. And uh, I actually signed up like a month before I graduated, and and, I, and the guy said, well, when do you want to ship out? And I go, well, give me a month after graduation to say goodbye to everybody and go to parties and stuff, and then I'll go. So actually, I uh, I went to boot camp in Orlando uh, back back in the, in 1974, they had boot camp in Orlando, Florida. And uh, so I went to boot camp in Orlando, and it, it used to be an Air Force base before it was a Navy boot camp. and. Uh, Half the time it was too hot to march and march around and drill. They had the black flag out, so we sat in our air-conditioned barracks and polished our boots. So, boot camp back then wasn't wasn't that wasn't that hard, man. The typical day was you get up and and go to class half the day, and then go to lunch, and then march around all afternoon, kind of deal. So, how did you get uh, directed towards the submarine? I'm glad you asked that. I got a good story to tell you about that. Uh, when I Talking back going to the recruiter guy, uh, I, I, I had this uh, uh, plan deal, Navy deal, they offered this deal at uh, enlistment if uh, electronic school guaranteed, it's like electronics, it's a program they had going, and if you pass A school, you, you got it promoted to third class. I thought, that's a pretty good deal. And so uh, when I was in boot camp, all the guys that were in the same kind of thing that I was in, they they brought us in and uh, and set us down and to look through these these uh, books with these class A schools that you could pick fill out this form here we go Navy forms now Here, here's how Navy forms work uh, so it had like five choices of schools to, A schools to go to okay so I look at it I I fill out the form I go hand it to the guy and he looks at it and he goes you didn't put anything in your fifth choice I go well you know I don't know what else to put he goes put down Polaris Electronics. I go, what's that? He goes, don't worry, it's your fifth choice, you'll never get it. And I was 17, so I said, okay. And the next day, everybody that had put Polaris Electronics on that for A school was going, getting mustered out to go take a submarine physical. I go, what's that? Submarine physical, what's that for? Well, you might get this class, we need to know if you can, okay, to go to this class. Oh, that's cool. And then, when we graduated boot camp and got our orders to A school, guess where everybody's going to A school at? Polaris Electronics A school. So that's how I quote unquote, volunteer to be in the subservice. So when you go to A school, Polaris like A school, then you go to C school, you're either going to a submarine or a submarine tender. So that's, that's my story on that. Reminds me a lot of how I got in the infantry. 
But it turns out, uh, once I got in the real working Navy, the subservice is, is the way to go, because especially on the nuclear submarines, they're, the crews are smaller, the officers treat you decent, the food's great, you get paid more money. It's, it's not a bad deal, man. Because <laughs> I've been on those service ships, and they're, they're disgusting, man. <laughs> <So. laughs> uh, what ports uh, would you, were you then? Okay, okay, here's yeah. the deal. Uh, uh, I get out of boot camp, I get ordered, you know, A school and C school was in Damneck, Neck, Virginia, and I spent like the first, I don't know, seemed like the first year I was in the Navy in, in class, either A school or C school. And here's the deal, uh, because I was on the, you know, you know subservice kind of deal, uh, most guys out of C school, they got orders to sub school in, 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 um, in Groton, but when I got orders, um, out of C school, I got orders to report to a boat. <laughs> I go, I go, chief, you know, did somebody screw up? He goes, oh, no, no, that's what the orders say. That's where you go, man. So I, I, so I, I never actually went to sub school like most guys. I went because that, that just shows you the need they had to fill billets on those uh, nuclear submarines back during the Cold War. And so I was an FT, so I guess that was a, actually I had a top clearance when I was an FT in the Navy. They did a background check in, uh, in my school and class and everything. Anyway, sideline story. But uh, so I went to the boat, did a patrol, and then after my first patrol, I say, okay, uh, okay, go over to the sub school and do the pressure test thing and the escape trunk thing where they, you know, fill you up with water and up to your neck and the little tank thing and you shove you out the door and you go up and you say, you know, ho, 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 till you get to the top. You get to the top, the guy says, stand over there, parade rest for 15 minutes, and then the doc checks you out. He's good. Okay. So that was my sub school. So I was on the Nathaniel Green. It was, it was, Homeport was in Groton, Connecticut. Okay. And the only, see, I was on a, what they call a boomer. They had two types of submarines on the Navy, right? Mm -hmm. Fast attacks, which were like just normal submarines. And they, they kind of patrol on their own. They go anywhere, do anything. Kind of, they actually do med cruises and make a lot of ports and they travel all over. Boomers, during the Cold War, they had they had Pacific Fleet, and I was in the Atlantic Fleet, so you had specific patrolling areas and just one overseas port, one home port, one overseas port. So I was, hmm. the overseas port was Holy Lock, Scotland. So you don't have a whole lot of exotic places you got to Actually, it's, it's, once you get into the routine of after you get qualified on your boat and your job and everything, it gets to be a, it's, it's a rotation thing because the Boomers had, had two crews. They had a blue crew and a uh, gold crew. I was on the blue crew. And so here's, here's the rotation way it works. See, see, I was on the blue crew. We fly over on a chartered flight. We, we meet up with the boat and the other crew, and we stay about a few days on the tender, and they spend a week or so getting the boat, what they call, turned over to the, our crew. And then once it's on turned over to our crew, then the, the gold crew packs up their crap, and they, they go home <laughs> for three months. And then we move down on the boat, and then we get spend another week or so, you know, loading stores, checking out stuff, getting ready to go to sea. And the patrols lasted for like 70 days, some odd days. If you go out and when you submerge, you don't come back in until you're heading back in. So you're 70 days underwater. That's what the uh, deterrent patrol, that's how I got this pin, deterrent patrol pin. The first patrol, you get the pin. The next pin after that, you get a little star to put in the pin. And once you get five stars, you get a little bronze star to replace the five stars so you keep going on it. Actually, I went to... Uh, to a uh, 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 and down in uh, Kings Bay, they have this World War II submarine veteran ceremony every year on the first of November, and I saw a, a chief guy, sub vet guy. He was he was a listed guy. He was walking around with a gold patrol pin, and I said, "Go! How does a chief get a gold?" He goes, "25 patrols." Can you imagine doing 25 patrols on a submarine? That's how you get a enlisted guy gets a gold patrol pin. So, wow. Well. Wow. Any more questions? <laughs> I should mention uh, that Frank here is a Navy vet, and he may well have uh, some questions. All right, shoot, Frank. Shoot. What you got, Frank? You, have uh, you talked about the food being good, and and my job uh, on the subtender was to get food for the for the subs when they were going out. Uh, what did you like about the food? And well, you know, I got tired. I I got really tired of eating steak and lobster every night. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I long for those pizza nights and hamburger nights, you know. Oh, seriously, we had steak and lobster, and we had uh, chicken. Uh, 
The only thing bad about being on the sub, though, was uh, we had fresh milk, but that only lasted about a week. And they had this powdered crap that they call milk that some guys learn to drink and like. I never did. And they had this other stuff that was more or less Gatorade kind of stuff. And then drank a ton of coffee. <laughs> And that's when I started drinking coffee when I was in the Navy. I did plenty of coffee, and it was pretty good coffee, so I got to be quite a coffee drinker in the Navy. But the food was great. They had, like, I think two or three mess cooks. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, funny thing, uh, on my boat, in the mess, you know, where you ate, the tables were bolted to the, to the deck. The benches, we sat on, like, their benches, and they were bolted to the deck. If you go on a Trident submarine today in their mess hall, they have just normal chairs like this just sitting around. I go, how do they? And they have a, a flat panel movie screen above. We had these movies. We had to watch the old timey with the reel to reel thing. And the thing would always break. They got to have to tape it. And they pull the screen down. And yeah, well, well. The, the, the seagoing Navy now submarine service, those guys live like kings, man. They, it is really nice way to go to sea. Didn't have any sea rations, huh? No. <laughs> no. Uh, you mentioned the Trident submarine. Uh, you had the Poseidon, I believe, didn't you? Yeah, I bought it was Poseidon missiles. Yeah. The Trident, see, I had, uh, it was 16 missiles. The, the Trident boats had 24 missiles. And uh, they have, I think they've done away with us. Now what they do is they call SS, they, they, they converted the SS, BN Tridents to SSGN. So in all the missile tubes where they used to have these big, you know, uh, Poseidon missiles with multiple warheads, and now they have these Tomahawk missiles. So you have like, mm. like, uh, like, yeah, actually 22. In each side of those silos, they have like 22. So they, they're tons of Tomahawk missiles. But on the Trident boats, two of the missile tubes are actually used for, uh, they have SEAL teams on those boats that do underwater ops. And that's where they, leave the ship and return to the ship underwater. So I try to try to boat there, you know, for the modern Navy I'm talking about, not back when I was in. We didn't have that. I guess that's what was used in the uh, not too long ago attack on Syria. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. We have uh, SEAL teams that are part of the crew of the Trident boats. And they're huge, man. They're, I mean, they're, they, see our boat had three, three levels in operations compartment and missile compartment. The uh, the Trident boats actually have four levels, and our crew's berthing. I say we were like lower level operations. They had the MCC and the cruise lounge, and then the heads, uh, bathrooms, <laughs> and uh, and then berthing. And everybody slept pretty much in the same berthing area, and that was a real pain because you go down to, you, and then you have a, a berthing chart. So to go down to wake up the guy to relieve you on watch, you carry because the, the light stayed off all the time because. Half the crew was sleeping all the time, and half the crew was on watch. So you go down with a flashlight, looking for the guy, wake up to relieve you, and God help you if you wake up the wrong guy. <laughs> because I'm not Smith. God, what the hell are you waking me up for? You damn non-qual puke. <laughs> oh, that's another thing. In the submarine service, uh, you can't wait to get your dolphins, man, because until you do, you're what they call a non-qual puke. You're the lowest form of life on the face of the earth. You get all the shittiest jobs, shittiest details, and uh, and you just can't wait to get. And it it took me like two patrols to get qualified because on my first patrol, uh, the sonar guys were a little bit short, and so the the officer in charge of the sonar guys came around looking for guys, to, extra guys to stand with sonar watches. And actually, I was you know my first patrol, so okay, you're gonna go stand sonar watches, okay? So okay, that's cool. And actually, I, I enjoy, really enjoyed doing that because uh, it wasn't in my rate, but I was like secondary kind of thing because you actually had to do something on watch. MCC on watch, the hardest thing to do is stay awake. <laughs> but on sonar watches, you're sitting in the little thing, turning the wheel, listening, you know, to the stuff. And I actually got to call in a, call in a, uh, uh, a, a contact one time, man. It was really cool, man. It felt like you're really in the Navy. So I'm sitting there, turning the wheel, right? You know, and I'm saying, hey, chief, I think I got a contact. He goes, well, call it in. I say, all right, chief. I go, you know, con sonar, we have a new contact, bearing 020, designate Sierra 34. This contact's been identified as a uh, freighter making eight knots on one three beta screw. Sonar con I. That was cool. I like doing that. That was fun. 
Oh, when you said short a minute ago, you weren't referring to height, you were referring to length of service, I presume, right? Short about what? You said if you were, you're talking about short people. Short people? Short. Uh, you're referring to the length of time left on the ship or in, in the service, I presume. Yeah. But here's my question. Uh, what about height? What about... Believe it or not, there were guys taller than me on a submarine. Really? The only thing, you had, you had to duck going through the hatches because they're the standard sight hatches, but the the <clears> ceiling height in operations was like, I didn't have to bend over much going walk around. You, did, I mean, have you ever been on a submarine, nuclear yeah, submarine nowadays? Not nuclear. World War II, so. They well, here's the deal. In Kings Bay, like I say, this this uh, this thing they have every day in King, every uh, November in Kings Bay is a it's a World War II uh, 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 thing for the World War II subvet guys. They they're dying out. You know, one day they're gonna be dead, but they they keep this going this thing for them, and 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 they actually do tours on the on the Trident boats. You have to sign up for it when you sign up to go down there for the ceremony thing, but they'll let you go tour a, a sub, and it's it's really interesting, man. People will be amazed, the people that have never been on one, just how big the thing is. And I'll back to the birthing thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to bounce around, guys. I'm sorry. I, my mind works that way. On our boat, it was like a pain, you know, to work. but on the Trident boats, majority of the crew's birthing is on the on the missile compartment in between the missile tubes, and so they have it kind of sectioned off, and like, it's about, I think, one, two, three, four, but six or nine guys in one little section and so that way it's like to say if you're like an FT well this is your little section and if you're an MT these guys are over here so they they're sectioned off so that way you don't have the problem of waking up somebody to go on the next watch that's not in your watch duty station kind of thing and another thing in the heads you know what the head is right bathroom uh, on our boat you know you had to you know like they had a, a ball valve and you had to you know, turn this one to get the water and put the valve and do the valve and boom. And God help you if you if you fail to do it, then the water start leaking out all over the deck. Another thing, good thing about one guy did that one time. I was on watch, and this the water was coming out, so I go in there and one guy had you know come out half asleep, went to the thing, forgot to cut the thing off, and water started leaking out. And so the chief comes around, and he goes, I'm down there. He goes, he goes, who, who do you know who was in here last? They go, yeah. He goes, go get him. Oh yes, sir. He's going to clean it up. You're not going to clean it up. He's going to clean it up. Another good thing about the boats is uh, my first patrol, the chief and I stood, we had two guys on watch. He stood watch with me, and it, our, part of our deal was after we get off watch, we're supposed to clean up the, the crew's lounge, take the coffee cups back up to the, the galley and kind of maybe scrub, you know, wipe the deck if any kind of coffee stain spills, you know, kind of, you know, police the area, clean it up a little bit. And believe it or not, the chief was on his hands and knees with me scrubbing the deck right beside me. That's how... Submarine crews work, man, everybody's together. It's not like a, on surface ships, it's like us and them, you know. On, on the sub, everybody's more, it's more of a cohesive crew. That's why I, that's why I promote the subservice, man. Anybody joins the Navy, I go, go to subservice, man. You, you won't regret it, I promise you. Uh, 1986, you were out, so you didn't have anything to do with this, but uh, your ship, your boat, ran aground in the Irish Sea. I read about that. I was at work one day just Googling, and I read this article about it. It was the gold crew that did it, by the way, not the blue crew. <laughs> they, it ran aground, and, and, and it turns out it they had to tow it back, and it, 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 it was going to cost so much to repair it that it was the salt treaty talks, so they just added that to the list of things to scrap to be in, 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 um, in line with this with the reduction of nuclear whatever. So that's why they just put it on the scrap list and just did away with it. I think they took it, they say the sail is in Orlando, it's a monument thing, and the rest of it, they think they towed up north and sank or something, I don't know, in the, in the Arctic Ocean somewhere. Use it for like target practice, I don't know what they do with it, when they get rid of stuff like that. Uh, when I was doing a little research on your ship, uh, one of the... Sub. No, no, submarine, boat. submarine's a boat. Uh, yeah, right. I keep forgetting. A that. destroyer's a ship. Why, a submarine's why a boat. Why do they make that distinction anyway? All right, I'll tell you what. A boat hey. is something you could transfer to a ship, to like a PT boat. PTs were boat, PT boats, because yeah. they could stack them on the deck of another ship. You can't put a battleship on, on top of another ship and carry it somewhere. Right. Submarines, you can actually. So they're, well, the world, well, World War, when they first started, the smaller ones, the World War II ones, were like mm -hmm. that. So, mm -hmm. a submarine is a boat. Always wondered about that. Uh, your boats had asbestos for insulation, and one of the I concerns guess, huh? is about 
uh, exposure to it. Have you had any issue with that? Have nope. you heard of anyone? No? Nope. Yep. No, no issues with that. That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah that's a real good thing. <laughs> <coughs> uh, your service uh, ended in 78. I was 74, 78, yeah. yeah. And then I went to college on the GI Bill, which was great. I don't know how it works now, but it worked out great for me. It wasn't enough to pay for everything, but it helped out a lot. But I still had to get like a student loan, and I actually worked part-time too to work myself through college. And it took me, <laughs> took me seven years to get a four-year degree, but I got it. Actually, I'm the only I'm, I'm the only member of my immediate family that, that graduated college. My dad never even finished high school. At yeah, one time, he was going to go back and, you know, get his GED, but that didn't work. <laughs> what college did you attend? I uh, the first college I went to was uh, Florida State, actually uh, in Tallahassee. I went two semesters. Actually, made the dean's list the second semester, and then I got tired of paying out of state tuition, so I transferred to West Georgia College in Carrollton. It's now West University of West Georgia now, but when I was there, it was West Georgia College, and I went there two years and got a two-year degree in computer science, and then at that point, I was a little bit older, you know, and I was tired of going to school, and, and so I started looking for a job, and I got a job in Savannah, Georgia, uh, with the city of Savannah as a actually a computer operator, but it turned out that I was there for about few, six months, a year, and, and their programming staff had about six women and they all kind of got pregnant at the same time and, and one of them decided she's going to not come back and so they'd open up a programming slot and so they opened it up for and I applied for it and because I had a two-year degree in, in computer science I got hired as a you know kind of programmer trainee kind of person and so I worked there for a year as a programmer and then I for some reason I decided I needed a four-year degree and, and so I decided to to go back to school full-time and I I went to Georgia as a like a transfer student based on my credits from West Georgia, and mm -hmm. went two more years at UGA and got a four year four year degree in computer science, and now I got that in '86, I think, and uh, that's when I got a job with Gwinnett County uh, IT department, and I worked there 23 years and retired in 2009 with a pension, and then six months later I hooked up with a staffing company that the uh, Gwinnett County actually. Half of it, they got eight programmers, and half of them are like paid contractors because how they cut costs of their staff, I guess. And so I got hooked up back with the county as a paid contractor. So now I work two days a week doing that as an hourly contractor. The only drawback to that is, you know, if you don't work, you don't get paid. <laughs> but hey, you know, it just adds to my pension a little bit. You know, get me over the hump until four more years later when I can just hang it up for real. <laughs> so life's good, man. I like to tell people my, my weekend starts on Wednesdays at four o'clock. <laughs> Always suspect we're out of the county. Life is life is good. <laughs> Plus, I got a lot of sideline stuff going on. I stay busy, man. I'm with uh, I'm a lifetime member of the VFW in Lawrenceville. I actually am a member of the American Legion in in. Uh, uh, too, but um, I don't go there much. And uh, sub vets, I'm really involved in the sub vets. Like I'm the base secretary of the sub vets mm -hmm. group in Atlanta, so I got a lot going on with that. And I play senior softball in leagues uh, and stay healthy with doing that. And I, I really like is uh, I'm a, since 1987 I've been in APA pool leagues. It's uh, you know it's like you know team pool leagues. I do that. Oh, yeah. I do that on Tuesdays. Is, Eight ball, when Thursdays is nine ball, playing the league, and it's in Loganville, the place I play at. Now I'll have to find out where you go and all. Do you like to play pool? Oh, yeah. Oh, I can hook you up with a team, man. It's, it's great. <laughs> yeah, they have, a, they have a national tournament every year in Las Vegas. You know, that you have to qualify, win your league, and then, and then you win your region, and, then you, and your actually team wins an entry into the national tournament in Las Vegas every year. It's in around August. Yeah, my, my days of playing pool almost came to an end when I was 12 years old and the dog ate all the felt off the table. But <laughs> I actually originally, originally bought me a pool table at my house. I, 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 look, I'm, I'm 61 years old and uh, I've been a bachelor all my life. Uh, had a few close calls with the opposite sex, but I managed to st 
say single. Uh, but anyway, it's not that big a deal. And uh, anyway, I turned my three bedroom house, the, since my parents no longer come to visit because they're elderly, I don't need a spare bedroom. So my three bedroom house is now a one bedroom uh, club I call Club Tom. <laughs> I got a pool table in my living room. I got a foosball table. I've got a poker table coming. Uh, I got a, a tiki bar on the back deck with a hot tub and ready to party, man. I am jealous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm having a big party uh, last Saturday in August. It's my annual luau party. I got a, I got a, a this uh, girl that does our parades. I met her at Hooters. She's a bartender at Hooters. She, she's well qualified to be a bartender at Hooters, by the way. And uh, she's going to be the bartender at my uh, luau party. <laughs> uh, speaking of ladies, uh, we have these mermaid pictures. I got a couple questions first. Though. Okay. okay. Shoot. For, for, for those who might be watching this who know nothing whatsoever about submarines, Tom, tell us about your patrols. It, tell us what a patrol was. What did you do? What was your day-to-day -day activity on the sub? Okay, I, can, I, yeah, I hadn't talked about much about my military. I'm supposed to be talking about military stuff. I thought about everything else. Okay, okay, patrol, okay. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you one thing I vividly remember. You know, it's funny how your mind works. It's things that happened 40 years ago, it's like it happened yesterday, and other things that happened last week, I don't, I don't have a clue. But anyway, I vividly remember my very first patrol, because I was the, the line talker guy, right, with, with the maneuvering watch. And so I was the, the next to last guy to go down before we go out and go. The other guy was the, the officer guy on deck. He was walking around, you know, making sure everything is hunky-dory. And he goes back up and he tells me to say blah, 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 blah. And so, okay, you go down. So I go down and then he goes down and we close the hatch. But I vividly remember, here I am, 17 years old, and we just left port. And I'm looking out and all I see is water. I go, what have I got myself into, man? Oh, my God. And, you, and, um, and so we, uh, you know, we go down, we submerge. And, and believe it or not, the, the World War II submarines were built, their hull was more like boats because they were milk built to be on the water with a diesel engine running on the on the surface they ran with a diesel they could do like 20 some odd knots submerge their own batteries they can only creep around like at four to six knots and so the majority of the time when they had to get somewhere fast they were on the surface hauling ass with their diesel the the nuclear boats have a have a round shaped hull they're not they're made to be submerged 90 percent of the time so they don't maneuver too well on the surface so they're constantly doing this a little bit of a roll and then in the north atlantic <laughs> in the winter time it it, it's more like this, and before you get, so you can't wait to get submerged because of boat. And I'm sitting there in an MCC, and we're doing this, and and the weapons officer goes, "You don't look too good. Why don't you go down on your rack for a little while?" I go, "Okay, sir." And so I go down, lay down, and I come back in, and go, "Are we down yet?" I go, "Oh yeah, we, we're down." And another thing in MCC, we had this uh, because we're in control of the missile launch scenario, we're fire control. We had this depth gauge above our console, so we, we uh, all the times we knew how deep we were. That was pretty cool. But anyway, back to the typical patrol. Okay, so uh, well, the main thing you're supposed to do uh, is get qualified. Okay, let's just say, for instance, we're, we're qualified. Okay, we got our dolphins. We went for the dolphin ceremony, which is another, you know, we'll talk about it. Anyway, okay, so you're a qualified submariner. You're standing, and then you qualify to stand your watches. And so it's, it's not day or night. It's on watch, off watch kind of thing. You know, you're on eight off, eight hours on watch, 16 hours off watch to watch a movie, sleep, eat, whatever kind of deal. So it's just, it's just a rotation thing like that. And, and uh, being during the Cold War, uh, we would have these uh, scheduled you know, drills like battle stations or, or flooding and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, but our chief would always come around and say, guys, we're going to have a, a battle stations about 15. <laughs> kind of give us a heads up to what's going to happen. And, and so you do the battle station thing. And so we'd, we would do drills about... The captain would do them like three or four times a week. And other than that, it's like, like I say, pretty much. But once you get qualified, it's, you're sitting there just, you know, smoking and joking and talking and stuff. And we, do, we did have movies to watch and everything. You had to, had to get the, the uh, captain's permission to what they call smoke the movie, you know, run a movie. If he said no, then it's no. <laughs> I could see that the captain is guy. If he says no, it's no. Talk about smoking. Uh. When I was then, they still allowed them to smoke. As I understand it now, there's no, I don't know what the guys to do to smoke because there's, there's no smoking on subs now. They, it, it's all gone. Can't smoke at all. 
and the MCC was the oh, oh but, but but the the nice thing about that back in my day the guys that didn't smoke they still packed a few cartons of cigarettes because one of the other guys that smoked ran out and said well I got a pack of cigarettes for a buck or two here if you you know <laughs> And the MCC was the Missile Control Center, I'm assuming. What, what does that acronym stand for? MCC? Missile Control. MCC is, I, I was in fire control. Okay. MCC is Missile Control Center. They, they have another panel console. They have three levels in the, in the missile compartment. It's where the MTs work. What was, your, what was your rate? What was your job title? I was a fire control ballistic missile. Okay. A little, you can't. Actually, there was a time recently in the Navy where some bureaucrat come with the idea of like the, the, the Navy is the only uh, 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 service that has these little see this is your rate I'm a second class this is your job most all the other services just have your rank they don't you know but the Navy designates what you are where you're like a, a boatswain's maid a blah blah and that's tradition man that's big deal and and they, and they, they were going to do away with that and just to make everything just a plain I guess the, the cost just was you know just make everything the same and plain and and the Navy wasn't having it, man. I mean, they had so many complaints and bitching and moaning. They go, oh, we won't do it. So that's, that's what's another thing unique about the Navy. So I was a fire control. They have fire control uh, for surface ships, too. But it's to seal the same thing. The interesting thing about this, this rate, uh, back in World War II days, they had what they called surface rates and below deck rates. Surface rates were about, there were about eight or nine of them, like something like uh for instance, a uh, 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 gunner's mate, torpedo's mate, quartermaster. Machinist mate. No, that was below decks. That's below deck. okay. service, service, like fire control, signalman, they were right slave rates for enlisted guys in World War II. So if you were sitting at a bar and I was, had a right slave second class next to a, like a, like a, you know, an engine man that had a, so he was second class, but he was the one left, I actually outranked him, you know, not above him. Even though we were the same pay grade, I was senior to him because I had a right. They'd, but then after the war, they decided that was too confusing, and they just put everything on the, on the left sleeve. All right, speaking of tradition, I'm going to go there, okay? You mentioned the dolphin ceremony. I'm big on tradition, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the dolphin ceremony. The dolphin ceremony. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, it, it, might, it wasn't that. Nowadays, they... they they cut it all out, but back in the day, uh, guys would drink their dolphins. I mean, there's a ceremony. But actually, I got my, my, I qualified on patrol, and, and uh, I'd like to say the pictures are at my mom's house, but with the, with the cap, in the control room with the captain, you know, giving me my, you know, my dolphins when I, could, when I finally got uh, qualified, you know, and, uh, and that was pretty cool. And the chief was there because he's a photographer. I got, I got a nice picture of it and everything. That was pretty cool. But anyway, the, what would, the guys would take you out and they'd drop your dolphins in this big pitcher of beer and put liquor in beer and you're supposed to drink it. And I think some kid, I think, died doing that, you know, too much alcohol, and they kind of outlawed that. But, but another thing about the back to the crow thing, uh, I was a third class when my first patrol, and then our weapons officer comes around at the time. He was actually a Mustang. He was an enlisted guy that went to OCS and, he was an older guy, but he was a lieutenant, but been in the Navy long. He loved diesel boats. He said, the nuclear boats suck. <laughs> but he, he loved diesel boats. Anyway, there was this Go, go Crow program at the time. And he goes, you guys need to take this rating exam. Both of us were third class. He goes, I go, why? He goes, he goes, you guys are right out of school. You know this stuff, man. I wouldn't be surprised if both of you made it. Oh, okay. And so while I was on patrol, I took the rating exam for second class. And, and Mac, my buddy, uh, I think I got a picture of him. This guy, it's not a good picture, but anyway, you can't see it. But anyway, we were both third class at the same time. Our first patrol, we both took the rating exam for second class. And damn if we didn't both make it, man. So I was in the Navy two years, a little over two years, and I was in second class. And we had a, we had a, <laughs> we had a mess cook on board that had been in like four or five years. Like, damn, Presley, I've been here five years. It took me five years to make second class. You're here. You haven't even been here hardly enough. I go, well, you know. <laughs> you mentioned another ceremony. You talked about the blue nose. Tell us about that. Pattern. Okay, blue nose, blue nose, blue nose. Well, this is for like all service and submarine stuff. The blue nose, it was, you know, they got a way up north in the North Atlantic Arctic Circle. It's when your ship or a boat crosses the Arctic Circle, mm -hmm. you are 
uh, in line to be what they call a blue nose. And they got patches for it and everything. And, and our vote, uh, the ceremony, and actually, they don't force you to do it, but if you don't do it, you're going to catch hell the rest of the patrol, so you just go ahead and do it and get it over with because, you know, that's where the older guys get to pay back for when they had to go through this crap. And so what they do is they, they, they have it in the, in the mess hall and mess decks, and you, and you walk in there. First of all, you, you poop your suit, you put it on backwards. And the reason you put it on backwards is because when you're sitting on this block of ice, this guy behind you is pouring ice down the, the back of you while you're sitting there reading this big, long piece of paper with whatever. And then they, got this, they, pick the, they pick the biggest, fattest, ugliest, hairiest guy to sit there to be King Neptune, and he has a cherry in his toe. So you have to, after you read the speech, you have to get on your hands and knees and crawl over and eat the cherry off the King Neptune's toe. And then, you, uh, then they get you up and they walk you to the, where they have this big vat of God knows what. I mean, the doc checked it out. It wasn't going to kill you, but you wouldn't want to drink it. But, uh, and then they drop a, a shrimp in there, and you, and you, and you kind of, you know, like uh, out bobbing for apples to get the, the thing out, and you pull out. And then, uh, and then you get it, and okay, okay, and then you walk to the end of the line, and they have another guy with some blue paint, and he puts blue paint on your nose. And then that's the end of the ceremony, and you go down to take a shower, and the electricians have pulled all the fuses, so they take a nice ice-cold shower, <laughs> and, then, and then you're a blue nose. <laughs> Fun stuff, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah, then you're, then you're, then, then you're initiated. <laughs> Take another bottle of water, or do you have any bottle of water? Around? My mouth gets awful dry when I talk a lot. Was there any uh, competition between the blue crew and the gold crew? How did how did th those two crews relate to each other? Did no, it was just the reason they had two crews is because the, it was during the Cold War, and they wanted the, the boat to be on, on patrol, you know, as much as possible. Uh, um, no, there wasn't any really competition per se. No, but uh. I tell you one thing: <laughs> the guys that were leaving, going back home, couldn't wait to get the boat turned over, and so they were busting ass to because everything had to be checked out, you know, before they could were allowed to leave the boat, you know. So they were, you know. Shoot! Back I'm back. Welcome back, world. <laughs> Did you have a story about selection of movies for entertainment? Yeah, back in my day, the the movies were those, you know, reel to reel kind of deals. You know, when you had to feed through the thing and everything. But they were, and they were, they were in these like cases. And so, prior to the uh, patrol, we'd get a detail together. And I, I one time I, I got picked to lead the detail, which is pretty good. It was me and like four or five other guys. We truck up to the tender where they have all the you know, the stuff, and we go to raid their movie locker, you know, and the guys on the tender really hated me because we take all the best movies, man. <laughs> we'd, look, we'd look through them, you know, you know, oh, we've seen that, and oh, we want, oh, this new release, oh, yeah, we'll take this one. And we load up with movies to load up on the patrol to take on a patrol, which is pretty cool. A little more serious question might pertain to what you guys are actually out there for, which was, of course, to engage in exchange of missiles with the other side, the Soviet Union, presumably. All right. Uh, to do that, you might have to test fire one. Did you ever? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, well, uh, I was real fortunate. One of my, uh, on one of my uh, 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 patrols, uh, we actually had, we got picked to be a, 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 participate in a test firing thing. That was really cool because you actually got the felt, what it feels like to be on the boat when they actually shoot the missiles. Okay, let me let me let me run through the scenario for you, where if I can remember. Okay, you're out on normal patrol, and then the captain, I guess, gets a message, whatever, to come. So we come back into the tender, and we offload the the real deal missiles, and then we load the dummy warhead missiles, and just then go back out like on normal patrol kind of deal. And but we know we're gonna eventually, you know fire them just waiting for the word so the next time you go to battle stations it's going to take it all the way to actually fire the, the birds and and they, they set it up with other ships to track you know we start in the north atlantic and they fire it in somewhere in the south atlantic where the other ships are tracking they're tracking the missiles coming down to make sure they hit what we, what we were supposed to hit kind of deal and that was really cool because but another thing guys like to do that because it shortens their patrol 
to that particular patrol because it breaks up the patrol. Instead of being 70 days underwater, we go back into the tender for, and spend like, I don't know, two or three days getting ready to go back out again. And then after we shoot the missiles, we, we did a little side trip to Charleston, which is, then we go back to the thing. And so it was really a good deal. Anyway, so we're, uh, another thing, I, my uh, battle stations when I first started was in the upper level missile compartment, they had what they call the OAG group, Optical Alignment Group. They had this, like, they had these tube things that went down, the, it was like to, to uh, gyroscope kind of things, these tubes that run along the missiles and upper, and that was my battle stations. I was up there with headphones on. And we had well, all the other guys were MCC in, in uh, fire control, and so that was pretty cool. And so I was up there, and I was actually in the upper level missile compartment when they shot. And you just feel the the deck just kind of goes boom, boom like this, you know. That was cool. How was the accuracy? Well, one of them went where it was supposed to go. The other one, I wasn't too sure. I don't know. <laughs> Hit right on target. The other one was a little off, I think. And they had the guy to come back to. Check the OAG group. Check and what was the distance? So what would have been the distance that it fired? I, uh, I forget. I don't know. It, it was hundreds of miles. <laughs> I mean, we're sitting off, you know, in the middle of Atlanta. We can it could reach Moscow, you know. So there, there was a joke we uh, we had. Of course, you know, it, it was you know, probably not a you know PC thing to stay, but it, we had uh, it was the the Hershey effect on the nuclear missiles. The Hershey effect is the first missile goes over and blow, and blow it. It has nothing but chocolate candy, so when all the all the Russian kids come out to get the candy, then the second missile goes over and just wipes them out. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll excise that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what else? Ask me something fun. Well, Ask me about the women. No. Can I talk about the women? You want to go, hey, there? go there. Talk about the women. Well, the way it worked in Scotland when I was in the, there, they, uh, a lot of, actually I knew a guy, I forget his name, but uh, I went to boot camp with this guy and I went to A school with this guy and he got to be an MT, but he got stationed on the tender in Holy Lock. And the last time I saw him, he actually was, he was stationed there for like, Oh, I mean, years. He actually met a local girl and married her, and so they let guys do that, you know. So that was pretty cool, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, you go to town, and it, 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 here's the deal. In Holy Lock, the tender was in the middle of the bay because the government didn't want us, the government nuclear stuff in the dock. So we had to be in the middle of the bay, so you had to take these, like, Liberty launch things back and forth to the thing. And at the end of the long pier, it was a, a bar kind of thing that most guys went to, and <laughs> it, uh, in Scotland, man, they 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 don't believe in a lot of, on ice. You know, you can't. It's hard to find like ice cold beer in Scotland. They it's, it's like room temperature beer. But uh, I like the way they serve uh, rum and coke. I went to the bar first. I went to the bar and ordered rum and coke. He sends me a little small little bottle of coke and a big shot of rum. Boom! There's your rum and coke. I go, okay, <laughs> all right. Oh, and it didn't take long to get snockered drinking rum that way. But anyway, back to the girls. You go downtown, and um, uh, they were friendly enough. The trouble I had was they spoke English, but they spoke so damn fast you couldn't understand. They want pot luck? What? You want pot luck? Do you want a pint of lager? You want pot luck? They talk so damn fast you couldn't understand. But the ones that hung out with you know American sailors, they, you know, you couldn't understand what they said. But anyway, the rule of thumb was because you you're there, you know, you know, periodically back and forth. But you you know you get to know some of these girls, and the deal is. And the girls know you too, so if you're the kind of guy that you know goes in there and tries to go with all of them, they're gonna see that right away. And then, then you're not gonna. <laughs> no, they, but if you stick with one girl and kind of like you know let her be like your girl kind of deal and be friends with her, then you're cool, you know. You know, you just you know be you know loyal to one girl and and you're cool. But if you try to you know mess with all of them, they, the world will get out on you and they blackball you and then none of them will talk to you. <laughs> So the old girl in every port should be one girl in every port. Well, actually, I could tell you about a story we we went to. Uh, when, this was when we went to Edinburgh. Uh, all I can tell you, there's well, it's no longer there, but uh, it was there in World War One and Two, and when I was there in the mid '70s, 17 Danube Street. It's like a brownstone building that they, the door stayed cracked open, and 
you know, it was a place where lonely sailors go to, you know, be uh, caressed with some friendly women. <laughs> Lose the loneliness. Isabel, I remember her well. Isabel, I'll always remember Isabel. <laughs> okay, I'm uh, kind of running out of questions. Here, any uh, thoughts by either of you? I'm, I'm having I'm having a ball, guys. We're having a good time too. We're having a good time too. I, I was going to ask you: Did you have any experience with any of any of the crew ever having claustrophobia? I, I just have a. It seems hard to me. To think no, but we did got one, one guy one time. One guy did contract hepatitis, and in the in our in our uh, birthing area, we only had two heads, and so the doc had to come in there and just quarantine one with only this guy uses this thing, and everybody else had to use just the one. So, but he got over it. We did have one innocent that uh, this. Remember, this is back during the Cold War years, and you know, public relations with foreign countries and stuff. They had this statue downtown, and I think this might have been on my first or second patrol. I didn't really know get all the details. This is kind of rumor mill stuff. But before we went on patrol, one guy on our crew, I forget. I don't even know. I don't even know the guy. Got kind of like really wasted, and the local cop caught him urinating on a statue. And the next thing you know, that guy was being shipped back to the States. He didn't make the patrol. I don't know, I don't know what happened to him, like punishment or whatever, but he wasn't around very long. <laughs> oh, another thing about uh, Scotland, uh, fish and chips. You know what fish and chips are? Mm -hmm. In, in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, here, here, every Liberty, this is the first place everybody goes. They had this little shop place. They had fresh... I mean, the fish was fresh because it was like, you know, the seaport thing. Fish and chips, you know, with a little vinegar. And everybody, that's where everybody wanted to go, right off, you know, fish and chips place. And another thing I thought was really interesting is, it was, well, Edinburgh was really kind of a small kind of town really place. And, and, the, and, the, and the local people there, I guess the, uh, they didn't have a lot of freezer, refrigerator stuff. And so most of the population there, they would shop for their, whatever they ate that day, you know, to eat fresh food. You know, the, the wife would go to the, go to the fruit market or whatever and get whatever they're going to eat that day, night for dinner. And like, they shop daily for their food and stuff, you know. I thought that was pretty interesting. Oh, that made me think of something. Uh, to this day, my, dad, my dad's 91 years old, by the way, and he still wears the little hat I bought him in Scotland. I went shopping, you know, like a men's store because my dad's really into hats and, uh, you know, like dress men's hats. It's like, it's just from Scotland. That's, that's what he, like, little, you know, Scottish men's dress hat. I went and I bought it and then, you know, shipped it back to him. And he, to this day, he still wears that hat. What's your best memory of your time as a submariner? You <laughs> Get, getting out of the Navy. Yeah, well, let's talk about that. <laughs> what made you leave? Uh, well, in the first place, I wasn't in it for the long haul. I was just in it to, so I could qualify to go to college on the GI Bill, but, uh, Here's the thing about the Navy. It's an all-volunteer service. They can't draft you to be in the Navy. They can do it with the Army and Marines, whatever. But See, once you're in the Navy, you realize what Navy really stands for. N-A-V-Y. Never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> that was a little joke we used to say. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> you did bring a sea bag full of goodies here. Do you want to show a couple of those? Careful, don't stand up too fast. Oh, yeah, I forgot about my... <laughs> yeah. Let me see what I got in this. Uh, oh, okay, let's talk about what's in the bag here. Oh, here we go. You probably won't be able to see this. Well, maybe you will, if I can get it out for a second. Uh, on patrol, when I was in the Navy, you didn't wear uniforms. You wore what they call a poopy suit. And nowadays, the guys on the trident boats, that you port on the boat, you go to the, I guess, the supply officer, and they whip out this nice, nice package, never worn, you know, nice, clean. When I was on the boat, he goes, go over there in the locker and find a couple that fit you, you know, left over. <laughs> That's how it was. You know, look at that locker and find a couple that fit you, you know. So I had some hand-me-down, crappy old, and here's the one. This is what they call a poopy suit. It's a... Uh, if you just hold it in front of you, Tom. You okay. Go. Called a it's a poopy suit. Poopy suit. It's it's made out of material that doesn't doesn't generate a lot of lint. So when you do it in the laundry, it's real it's real thin. 
I mean, it's just it's made to be worn on patrol. You wouldn't want to wear this, you know, outside anywhere or anything. But in the but during the winter months. I did have some long underwear I wore under this thing when I was on patrol, and you know it's like a it's a poopy suit, you know. It's like it's like a few pockets and it's Velcro thing, and this is what you wore. Officers and enlisted alike, they all of course the officers had theirs, you know, they had a lot nicer ones with you know their stuff on it. But poopy suit. And uh, nowadays, you know, uh, I guess the movies and everything, uh, and they have they, they allowed the, the ship caps to come back in style, and so. And so nowadays, if you're on a submarine, I, I had this made uh, long after the fact. I never did wore this. This is what when I was in the Navy, but this is long after. They have these nice little, you know, caps. You know, it has the name of the ship and the hull number. And and see, this is silver dolphins for enlisted, gold dolphins for officers. And then your hull number. And I added the blue crew on the back because I'm the blue crew. This is like the, the, the modern kind of deal, which is great. Back in my day... <laughs> You're looking to get any kind of cap. Other side, the crappy cap that you got out of boot camp, which nobody wore because it, it was it was crap, basically. And here's what we got. Here's here's, here's the, what my actual cap on my boat. It just had the whole number. And this is like a wool, you know, adjustable, stretchy baseball cap. This is my actual. I, I saved it from my. This is like a little nostalgia piece. And Tom, you mentioned that when you were in the Navy, that they didn't they didn't put whole numbers on the. On the boat, it was right? during the Cold War. Everything right. was stealth. Okay. No, they didn't. I mean, all that, all those pictures you see of submarines with a nice hold on there, that was right out of the yards when they were doing, you know, the official Navy photo stuff. When they were actually in the real working Navy, they, you know, they were just a black sail. Of course, they were submerged 90% of the time anyway, so it didn't really matter. Uh, question. Uh, I was in Charleston, and uh, one of the more interesting aspects some of the radio stations would uh, stand on top of the Cooper River Bridge, so when the nuclear subs would come in, they would then record that and put it on the air, and they did that because it had to go all the way up the Cooper River, and then they had to get relieved and all that. And that gave the boyfriends time to get out of the wives' houses. <laughs> Ah. Are you, do you have any stories about that? Well, I could I tell you a story that one of my sonar tech buddies, when I was standing sonar watches, told me, related to me, because it's, it's his story, so I just take him at his word. Uh, in, uh, in Groton, you know, the, uh, when, the, when the guys, when the wives, you know, kiss the guys goodbye, go on patrol for 70 days, and they're gone for three months. Most of them, some of them eventually end up at the officers' club and the old club, you know. And, <laughs> and this one guy was telling me about, he kind of, you know, hooked up with one of these gals, and, you know, and he woke up one morning with her, and he looks up, and it looks kind of, and her closet door's open, and he sees this, this officer uniform. <laughs> <laughs> and in the, you know, in the closet, you know, and he goes, whoa, I don't think I need to get out of here, kind of deal. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, I guess that sort of thing. Well, you know, you know, of course, hey, when I was back visiting, you know, 17 Danube Street, I, we walk, me and my buddy walk in, and, and there's like four married guys from our boat standing there, so, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, let's talk about this. Uh, long after my Navy career was over and I pretty much forgot about my subservice and everything, I was, uh, I live in Lawrenceville, Georgia, by the way, for, and uh, they have uh, converted the uh, bottom floor of the old courthouse building in downtown Lawrenceville to a veterans museum. And they get, oh, it's great, man. It's a really, it's a really nice museum. They had tons of uniforms and it's really, really a lot of stuff. And I was there one day, the first time I was there, I ran across these two guys, and they were wearing this, this kind of vest thing, and I got to talk with them, and it turns out they were subvet guys. And what I didn't know at the time, this was like seven or eight years ago, was there's a, uh, an organization called the United States Submarine Veterans, Inc. It's a nationally organized group of submarine veterans, just for submarine veterans. And so uh, they got to talk to me about it and convinced me to join. You know, it's kind of like being in the VFW or whatever, and they have what they call bases, you know, and they're like 65 some odd scattered all over and they have an annual national convention and 
regional conventions and this, that, and the other. And so, and this is my... Uh, yeah, hold it up hold a little it up higher. By your chest. Hold it up by your chest. There you, there you go. Yeah, see, so it's got, uh, it's real cool. It's got, you know, what, what most guys do is they get a vest like this, and some of them are a lot fancier than this. Mine's just a plain one. And it's uh, got, you know, you put the, actually, I'm the base secretary now. I started out being just a flunky, and then I was there for a year, and they made me vice commander, and then two years later, I was commander and for about four years and now I'm the base secretary guy so I've done it all and this is our this is we have actually we'll have our own little grayback base patch and uh what else we got over here this is my patch that's my uh rating badge patch they can get those on you can shop around on eBay and these and this I got this because uh our 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 uh sub vet group we do what they call boat sponsorship because the uh, USSVI has this quarterly magazine that goes out and so when you're a boat sponsor from a base that means you pay for the subscription for the magazines and they send it to the boat. And being where, you know, based in Atlanta, Georgia, there's a USS Georgia, it's a it's SSGN, and so we pay for their subscription to the USS VI. So it's a way for the, uh, the, the active crew guys to know about us, our organization, and mm -hmm. maybe join up when they get out of the, the service yeah. kind of deal. It's just like a re recruiting tool, basically. And uh, this is a patch for my boat, the Nathaniel Green, which it got scrapped and. 86 is a gone but not forgotten patch. They, they do those. And here's, see, I'm a life member, and it's based on your age when you do it. You know, you know the, oh, oh the, older, the older you are, the more, the cheaper it is, you know. The younger you do it, it's, it's, more, it's based on your thing. And uh, I only have the one boat. Some of our guys that, we have guys that were like spent, you know, careers in the Navy. They, they were on like, you know, five or six boats just listed down through here. It's just pretty cool. And here, well, we talked about earlier. Here's my blue nose patch. <laughs> and what else? What else? Oh, here's here's the patch from. Uh, so we're the Grayback base. This is a patch from the uh, the World War II Grayback submarine. See, it has well. Hold it up a little higher. Yeah, hold it up a little higher. See, it has the mermaid. Can you see it? It's got like a yeah. mermaid without her top on, which is all mermaids wear. Okay, all right. What else we got on here? Oh, okay, here we go. Here's here's something real important. Uh, it's cats for kids. What this is is a uh, is an outreach program the USSVI does, and what we do is we uh, we have quarterly visits to the Atlanta Children's Hospital in Atlanta, and we set up in the lobby and we bring uh, like coloring books for the kids to the patients to color in. We kind of socialize with them a little bit. We we give them the little girls. We give them like little pink hats that says honorary submariner and the, and the boys, we give them little blue hats that says honorary submariner and we, we make a little certificate and put their name on it and, to make them an honorary submariner, you know, they really, kids really go for it. It was started, it was started by some guys in California that, you know, these guys that are mostly the terminal ill or they're going through cancer and, and they get their heads shaved and, and they always have to have these little hats to wear. He goes, let's we'll give them a, a submarine hat to wear, you know, cool. and they, they really like it, man. I'll bet. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Here, here's this thing I can talk about. I'm, I'm full of these tidbits of information that nobody really cares about. Raise that up a little yeah, so we can up. see it. Okay. This is a USS Sea Lion. Here's the story about the Sea Lion. Back when they started the uh, the subvet thing, originally it was started by the World War II guys, subvets. And and if you don't know, during the war, World War II, there were 52 submarines that were lost. 52 submarines and and the submarine service suffered percentage-wise the highest casualty of World War II because think about it, when the submarines get sunk, it's 80 guys, it's, they're dead, they don't come back. If you're in the Army, maybe two guys get shot or wounded and they come back, so it's not like the whole thing gets wiped out. So percentage-wise, like one out of every four submariners died in World War II. But anyway, so they started that in, um, right after the war, and uh, what the World War II guys did is they assigned a lost submarine to a state. So each, each, each state, and, and because there are 52, New York and, and California, such big states, they got two submarines assigned to them. Now, the submarine they got assigned to Georgia is the USS Sea Lion. This is the original Sea Lion. About on uh, December 10th, after Pearl Harbor, the base that this was stationed at got bombed. And so the Sea Lion it was at the dock, it got so badly damaged that they, they scrapped it, so it never actually made a war patrol. And later, during the war, as the Royal Cabrest, and they made new submarines, they came out with another new submarine, they called it the Sea Lion II. And the Sea Lion II, I actually got a model of it. it, it's the only submarine that actually sank a Japanese battleship during World War II. Hmm. 
just a little tidbit of information for you to talk about. Okay, got a few things in here you want to show? Well, uh, I brought this again with my uh, subvet group. Uh, we have this uh, parade subfloat that we started. Uh, let me look for it, see if we can find a good picture of it that might show up. Oh, here we go. Can you see this, Ralph? If you just hold it up underneath your chin, we should be good. Okay, let me, can you see this all right? It's yeah. probably, probably not gonna come yeah. in. Nope, you're good, you're good. Anyway, okay. well this is, is uh, this is a picture from our, this year's uh, Memorial Day Parade in Dakota, Georgia. We've been doing it since, uh, since 2013 was our first year. And our, and they give away these, uh, uh, Original theme like prize, it's a hundred dollars. It's a it's like a little trophy and a you know like a banner thing, and f we've won it every year six straight years. Uh, our parade so floats. Now we we do other parades too, and we do uh, what we call static displays. Like here we are. Uh, uh, one of our, one of our guys is uh, another thing to subject through is. Uh, we go to these uh, Boy Scout things that do Eagle Scout ceremonies, and, and, and the USS VI has a special Eagle Scout um, you know, patch they give out. And, uh, and uh, his name is, uh, what's his name? Uh, David Cox. He's not, he's not in the picture, but there was a, uh, near Covington, there was a Boy Scout Camp Out 100, and we were there at a, at a static display for that. Where is it at? Uh, just this you know, public relation kind of thing, just to get people to know who we are, what we do. Because there's a lot of, believe it or not, there's still guys that were in the, in the subservice that don't even, are not even aware of the USS VI. So we try to promote, promote that as much as we possibly can. Okay, see, and our, here's, here's our, it started out as a, as a drop tank from a salvage yard in Barnesville. And we, and we painted it black and put a sail on it and turned it into the, because there actually was a USS Atlanta, we turned it into the USS Atlanta. It's about the size of the Hunley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, what else we got to talk about? Anything else? <laughs> How long have we been doing this, by the way? Eh? I guess what we could ask, if uh, we don't have anything further, would be to get your general thoughts about service in the Navy, and I think you'd already talked about trying to promote the idea of people going into submarines. Every kid I meet that thinks about going into the Navy, I say, man, you ought to join the subservice, man. It's the only way to go to sea, man. Unless, unless you're on like a carrier, maybe, but I wouldn't want to be on a carrier with 5,000 other guys. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, think about it. You're stationed on this ship for like two years, and you see some guy ashore, you know, yeah, I'm on that ship. You'll never see the guy before in your life, you know, because it's 5,000 guys on the ship. I have a question. Uh, we read about that the Navy is now putting uh, females. On bad the idea. Bad, bad, bad idea. Have they done that in submarines too? Yeah, they already started. They're gonna. Uh, they started out with just female officers, and now they're gonna expand it to enlisted. But it's it's another one of those bureaucratic. Uh, so tell us why. It's, it's not a good idea. So tell us why. Why, why do you feel that that's a bad idea? Well, you know, I don't have anything against women per se. It's just that, you know, in women on submarines, it's not a good idea, you know? I mean, it's just, it's just not. I mean, you know, it's not that they probably can't do the job or whatever, but uh, it's just, I just don't think it's a good idea. I mean, I'm, I'm, call me old school, old fashioned, whatever, but and everybody I talk to says, it's, it's, even a lot of women I talk to say, no, that's not, a, that's not a good idea. They've, they've had incidents of, of, of like, you know, taking pictures of them in the shower and that kind of thing, and it's just, it's just not good. But they, they're going to do it, I guess. It's progress, I guess, <laughs> for what it's worth. I don't think so. <laughs> how, is, how did your service in the Navy inform the rest of your life? Did, anything you can say about your overall experience in the well, Navy? Well, when I was talking about all my... When I was, Told all my, my high school buddies, <laughs> this is back, remember back in the 70s, they all thought I was nuts, but. <laughs> no, I, 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 the best, well, sit here talking about, you know, the, you know, it sounds nostalgic and fun, exciting, but hey, there's a lot of things about being in the service that you know, it really sucked. Uh, it's like, 
you know, going to the waiting like two hours for 300 other guys to go through the chow line ahead of you. And, and when I lived on on the base there, when I was like, you know, in the working Navy part on the on the barracks, uh, you get up on Sunday morning, you go into the to the head there, to, and like half the sinks got all they're all just disgusting, and half the toilets are all. I mean, guys that live there, they just trash. I mean, it's uh, it's just, uh, and, you know, that makes you want to just you know, get an apartment, live off base, you know, kind of deal. Because you know, you know, most guys are pigs, you know. What was the biggest advantage though of your military service? Do you think was there an advantage to it? You mentioned the GI Bill. Well, I'm not sure how it works nowadays, but yeah, that, that was that was the that was the main attraction for me when I first joined. But then uh, I I kind of like got kind of like sucked into the subservice, and and once I got into it, I thought, well, that's that's really the way to go because you know in the Navy you got to go to sea at some point, and going to on a nuclear submarine is about the best way to go. Mm, because the 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 subs they're I just I said I can't talk. They're immaculate. They're but first of all, they're really screened the people that that are that serve on them. So you're you're dealing with you know top notch quality people you know all around you and uh, not a not a not a cull in the bunch. They're all top notch grade A people and uh, they work hard. Uh, they play hard. The, the ship is immaculate. I mean it, it stays super clean. And the food's great, and like I say, you get paid extra for being in the subservice. It's just, just, just the, the best way to go to sea, in my opinion. And the officers are, are not like us and them thing. They're more, it's more of a cohesive thing. And you get to know the officers real well and the chiefs real well. And, oh, reminds me. Uh, speaking of the chiefs, on our boat, where the chiefs stay, it's called the goat locker, right? You, you know, guys know that. Well, don't ask me why. It's just the term. The goat lockers were the chiefs. Anyway, on our boat, their their little quarters were not much better than the regular crew. But on the Trident, you guys have got to tour a Trident boat. The goat locker on the Trident boat is the Taj Mahal. You walk in there. First of all, there's a room as big as this room. That's their lounge. It's got flat panel TV screens up. And they got bunk spaces on both sides. A huge head. I mean, they live like kings, man. Yeah, it's awesome. So that's the deal. Something to shoot for. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, did you want to make any closing comment with regards to uh, your service? Uh, Go Navy, beat Army. <laughs> hey. <laughs> You're outnumbered here, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Roger, we got you. <laughs> well, that's why you're so quiet. You're an Army guy. Oh, yeah. All <laughs> oh, this Navy talk kind of bores you to death, doesn't it? Yeah, my only experience on a Navy ship was before I went into the Army. I, uh, When I was at the Citadel, we stayed on a LPH, a landing platform helicopter that was berthed in New Orleans. We were down there for... Mardi Gras, yeah, and uh, that was without doubt the most miserable. <laughs> I mean, you've got maybe six inches. I mean, you're stacked up. I think it was four deep, and uh, the amount of space between you. And oh, that was another thing about our berthing uh, on our boat. Uh, yeah, first of all, it was kind of a. <laughs> it's a good thing the young guys, because it took a little bit uh, of you know maneuvering to get in your rack to begin with, and once you're in there, you got to make a decision: do I want to sleep on my back? I yep. don't want to sleep on my stomach because once you're in, there ain't no rolling over. Because <laughs> the other one is like this, you know, yep. from you, you know. So I think I, because it was a lot easier to get in, I think I pretty much slept on my back because it was a lot easier to get in and out of the rack that way. Yeah, but you said those were actually blackout, whereas what I experienced, they had lights on 24 hours. Well, not both because half the crew was asleep all the time on patrol, so they kept the lights out all the time. Yeah, I think they kept the lights on just for us. One more question from me. Uh, how would you describe your house that you live in now? Is it organized? Everything has a place? Well, right now it's in kind of a little bit of disarray because I'm in the process of turning it into Club Tom. But generally speaking, I'm a very neat, organized kind of person, man. I get that from my mom. She's always been very neat, organized, and yeah. hard work. That way at home, too. And my dad, on the other hand, he's a slob. I think it's because I learned it living on board ship. 
You have to be organized and you have to keep things clean. Well, on a sub, you know, you learn to maximize the space yeah. you got, you know. Right. you got to use what you can. Okay. So it's, it's, it's good training. I mean, you know, um, generally speaking, you know, a lot of countries, they, they have mandatory uh, service, like guys out of high school. If they're not actually going to college or something, they have to do. I think in America it would be a bad idea. Just, just, you didn't have to be the military. It could be like, you know, serve a year in the Peace Corps or something, or just do something as a payback, you know, because we live in the greatest country in the world, you know, people don't believe that, you know, can go to hell as far as I'm concerned, all these damn Democrats that keep bad-mouthing America, man, it's the greatest, go go live in Timbuktu somewhere and see how they treat you over there, man, you know. I think that is not Well, I really bad. enjoyed talking to you guys. Uh, we had a good time, too. <laughs> I had a great time. I haven't had this many chuckles in a while. <laughs> Hi. Well, sir, thank you for your oh, can I, time. For I'm, your I'm, I'm not supposed to move. I'm, I'm, I'm wired in here. You know, I can't yeah, move. I'm kind of. Well, thank you so much. Hey, well, hey, go Navy, beat Army. Yep. And uh, if you join the Navy, really consider the subservice. Awesome. Awesome.